If you have your Bibles with you, I would invite you to turn with me uh, to the Gospel according to Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2 in the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with verse 13. If you're physically able, we just kindly ask that you would stand uh, for the reading of the Word of God, just for a few moments if you are physically able. I want to read from uh, two different translations uh, from the Word of God, the New International Version, and the other is the OM3 translation. That's the Otis Moss III translation. Uh, that'll be out next year, edited by Pastor Meeks and Reverend Thurston. Amen. Uh, but beginning with verse 13, this reading from the NIV and a contemporary reading of this reads this way. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Africa. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and during the night and left for Africa where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Africa I call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died after his term limit was up an angel of the lord appeared in a dream to joseph in africa and said get up take the child and his mother and go to the land of israel and those were for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead so he got up took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. Take the child and his mother and escape to Africa. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I would like just for a few moments that we have for this teaching uh, this evening, I would like for us to deal with this subject of a conspiracy to destroy black children. A conspiracy to destroy black children. If you could turn to your neighbor at this time, don't look at me. I'm in a different neighborhood. Look at your neighbor. You're looking dead at me. I can see you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. It, is it is time to counter, to counter the, conspiracy. the conspiracy. Amen. Amen. A conspiracy to destroy black children. Now, beloved, there is a comfortability with black death. The sonic resonance of names torn from this earth uh, by unnatural causes tend to fade quickly from memory with a strange and suspicious sorrow. When these names are attached to bodies encased in skin darkened by God, but some strange way cursed by men, there is an uneasy acceptance of abnormal actions as if they are normal. Names spill from our lips with the ease of a drunken man's, a meaningless monologue. Maybe our greatest sin is not that we sin, but that sin has become so common that we can no longer feel it scratching at our soul. 
Uh, sorrow stops by. Uh, but never lingers, for the visits are so frequent, we do not act surprised when she comes to town. And arguably one of the greatest articulators in our generation, uh, Reverend Thurston, is a gentleman by the name of ta Coates, who wrote a book, Between the World and Me, and an article in The Atlantic entitled, The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Uh, you can pick up his essays, but it is Coates on such a powerful way he raises the question that no matter whether you are bourgeois or you are struggling from check to check, that we all to some degree fear for our children. He does a better job than I could in any way, shape, or form to be able to talk about the challenges that are facing our community, uh, giving the historical perspective and also critiquing the policy in America. But he says that there is a systematic attempt to harvest the genius and strength of black personhood for economic and cultural purposes. Why are black people viewed as a prophet and a problem at the same time? Why is it that black people are feared and at the same time desired? We want everything that we produce, but at the same time don't want us in the same space. Uh, witness at a particular level of the profit and historically devices that have been employed to maintain our current system, Coates goes on to say. But I say that black body serves as an endless supply of guilt-free labor for this country. Uh, do not forget, America was built by us. America was established by us. And uh, those black bodies, many people named and unnamed, are the ones uh, that created this so-called land of the free and home of the brave. But it is W.E.B. Du Bois who says maybe we should call it land of the thief and home of the slave. Uh, subjugated people serve as the lubricant and coal to power a machine designed uh, not for God's glory but for man's finite exploits. Uh, there are the writers that could do a much better job uh, than I, but these egregious actions, and it is Coates who says it this way, that when you take mass incarceration plus economic exploitation plus poor education, you always get subjugation. That whenever you have these three things together, something happens to a community. Mass incarceration, economic exploitation, and poor education. It is a trifecta. But I am so glad that I am in Salem tonight, a church that recognizes that we are not just here to worship and just lift up praises on Sunday, but are committed to transforming what happens in our neighborhood. Because there are some churches that are solely interested in solely just praise, praise God. Uh, that is good to have vertical praise, but if you have no horizontal outreach, you really don't have a cross. You have nothing but a stick. And the only thing you can do with a stick is hit somebody upside the head. But I'm glad I'm in a black church tonight and not a church just with some black people because there is a difference between the black church and a church that just has black people because a black church comes out of a particular tradition. That is the church that Harriet Tubman was a part of, was able to start the Black Lives Matter movement before the Black Lives Matter movement was even started. The black church is the place where Sojourner Truth was able to lift up and say, ain't I a woman before men and women to say that I and an abolitionist. It is the church where Frederick Douglass got his power, where W.E.B. Du Bois found the souls of black folk, where Booker T. Washington learned how to become an entrepreneur, where Marcus Garvey understood we have one God, one aim, and one destiny. It is the place where A. Philip Randolph learned how to organize, and Martin Luther King Jr. found his dream, where Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. It is the place where Shirley Chisholm said, I'm unbossed and unbossed. It is the place where Harold Washington got his power to be able to run for mayor in Chicago. There is power within the black church. And we must recognize and reclaim that power.
Because when we reclaim that power, we recognize that when we have the right theology, that it will literally change our anthropology, and that anthropology will shift our psychology, give us a new sociology, and literally change our biology. But let me break it down so you understand what I just said, because theology is your relationship with God. When you know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that means it changes your anthropology. That is how you view yourself as a human being. When you view yourself as a full human being within the glory of God, it changes is your psychology that means that my mind and my possibilities the lid is lifted off the limitations that the world has placed on me and when my psychology changes then it changes my sociology that means that I can work with you and we can break down barriers and when we know that we can work together it literally changes my biology because I stand with my head up my shoulders back and know I'm a child of God that's what happens when you're in the right church that it literally will change things in your life. And so when we look at this particular text, we see here, usually this is used during the time period of what is known as the Advent, but it is perfect for this Black History Month because this is the birth of Jesus that marks a historical and theological shift in the universe. God identifies with those who are subjugated and also exploited. But let me give you a little background that here Jesus is born at this moment and all of a sudden there is a leader by the name of Herod who has come to power and he is is intimidated by a child. Ah, let me say it again. You have a leader that comes to power who ha is so insecure that even a child who can't talk, he's worried that it will bring his kingdom down. And it is Herod who has been making money as a result of mass incarceration according to Obi Hendricks because it is Herod who says that he would have to throw these uh, major military parades every week because he wanted people to know that he was in charge because he had to have a military parade every other week to let everybody know he's in power. You see, when you're really in power, you don't have to tell people you're in power all the time. And so Herod is running the system at this moment. He has made money, according to Aubrey Hendricks, as a result of mass incarceration in Rome. He represents Rome and represents the empire. But he hears that there is a new king in town. This king is just a child, but he's intimidated by the child. Ah, it is going to mess up his entire system, but this is the thing that messes me up. A child is born, and Herod is afraid of the child at this moment. He is afraid and scared of the child and will mean the end of his tenure. But here is how we need to counter the conspiracy that seeks to destroy our children. It is right here in the text because that's what I love about the text is that an angel decides to visit a brother by the name of Joseph. Says to Joseph, I want you to take a Mary and Jesus down to Africa. You completely missed it here. Here you have an angel talking to a father, talking to a man, talking to a brother and saying, I've got an assignment for you. Mary's going to nurture the baby, but I want you to protect the baby because I want you to understand that even though my child is not of age, my child shall change the world. How do we counter the conspiracy is simply understanding this is that the enemy is worried about your future. Your past is already set, but your future is open. You've got to understand something here. It is Herod who's worried about the future as a result of this child coming into the world. Let me help you out. Part of the reason that mass incarceration is functioning in America is because there are people who are worried about the future of our children. How do they set up prisons? You need to know what privatized prisons, how they are set up. They are set up by checking out the test scores in third grade to determine how many prisons we need to build in the future. In in other words, somebody's making a profit off of black and brown bodies and they are worried that if all of a sudden we know who we are and know whose we are, no longer will we put money in your pocket that all of a sudden we will begin to change our community. I'm here to let you know that your future is open. The enemy is worried about our future. When we decide to stand up and be who God wants us to be, I'm let want to let you know that nothing can 
stop us. Your past has already been set, but your future is still open. Stop looking behind you and look forward at what God has for you. I know you messed up, but tomorrow is another day. I know you had challenges, but tomorrow is another day. And I'm here to let you know if God woke you up this morning, that means I'm giving you another chance. Your future is open. Your past has already been set. Is there anybody in here? Are you excited that God gave you one more chance, one more opportunity to get things right? The future is open, but the past has already been set. It is one individual that goes to our church, a gentleman by the name of Charles Perry, a Charles Perry who works with young people across this city to ensure that they have a future. He tells them because Charles spent 17 years incarcerated, but when he got out of, of prison, he decided he would dedicate his life to ensuring that no other young person had to experience what he experienced. He said that he learned something from his mother. He said that every time he wakes up, he puts his feet upon the ground. He knows that the devil gets upset. He says, I say to myself every day, not today. Because I know that there's going to be a temptation, a challenge, and a problem. But I have to tell myself, not today. And so I know that my future is open even though my past has already been set. And so what I love about this particular text is you will notice here that there they go down to Africa. It is Joseph who takes Mary and takes Jesus down to Africa. Because if we are going to counter the conspiracy, in order to stop the conspiracy, that we've got to learn how to dream even for those who don't even have a dream yet. You will notice that Joseph uh, has a dream. Jesus doesn't have the dream. Mary doesn't have the dream. But he has a dream for his adopted child. He has a dream for his family to protect his family. And that is what must happen in this day and age when we have a collective dream to dream for our children before they even have dreams for themselves. That we can see God using them in the future and doing great things with them in the future. And that is what God is calling us to do. And that is what I love about Joseph, that maybe we need to lift Joseph up more in the Bible. He only makes a short appearance. He's the adopted earthly father of Jesus. He makes a short appearance, but watch what Joseph's job is. His job is to hear a word from God to protect his family. That even though he doesn't show up later in the gospel, he's done enough right there. And maybe we we just need some black men who are willing to hear a word from God to protect their families, to protect their children, and stand up for their community. That I love this because God chose Mary to nurture Jesus, but God chose Joseph to protect the child. And so God says, in order for me to protect my child, I want you to go down to Africa. Oh, you missed your shout right there. God does not say, uh, I need you to hide in Rome. He does not say, I need you to hide in France. He does not say, I need you to hide in Sweden. He says, I want you to hide among camouflage. People who look just like you, you're still missing what I'm trying to say. It's easier to hide in Inglewood than it is in Elmhurst. You got to hide around people who look just like you. And so we see in the word that God instructs Joseph, take my child to Africa. And maybe that is part of the challenge for the church today that we have gotten so caught up with the European perspective on so many things, that we have forgotten our own history, that we've got to return back to Africa. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to get on a boat to go on back, but you need to know a little history about your community. You need to understand that when you read the Bible, you're not reading about Charlton Heston or anybody else. 
that the people that you're looking at from Genesis to Revelation are people who look just like you. Somebody doesn't believe what I'm saying. That when you open up the pages of the Bible and you find out where Eden is, it says the Tigris and the Euphrates. But don't miss out on two other uh, rivers. There's one called the Hala uh, and the Pashan. And the Pashan is what is called the Blue Nile. It flows right through Ethiopia. And last time I checked, when I talked to Louis Leakey, who found the oldest human remains on the earth, they found them not in France. They didn't find them in Russia. They didn't find them in England. They found them right in Ethiopia. You still don't believe me, but I've got to let you know that there's a person by the name of Noah. Noah had three sons. One of his sons was called Ham or Cush. And some people like to say that was the black son. But everybody who knows genetics knows that you can't have one black child and everybody else is a different color. You've got to have all your children coming from the same genetic pool. It just means that Cush, uh, better known as Ham, just simply migrated to a place called Nubia. Nubia is another term for Ethiopia. Another term for Ethiopia is Egypt. But another term for Egypt is also Carthage. Another term for Carthage is Libya. Another term for Libya is Hippo. Another term for Libya is also Kemet. You got to know that we are a part of the tradition. You still don't believe me. When you get to Moses, don't forget that Moses was raised in Africa. I know some of you think that Egypt is in the Middle East. How are you going to be in the Middle East or something when you don't even know if you're in the middle of it or if you're in the East? You got to know that Egypt is a part of Africa and the Arab population did not move down to Egypt until 626 AD. That is 626 years after the birth of Jesus, which means 626 years before the Arab invasion. There was nothing but folk from the south and west side of Chicago hanging out down in Egypt. You still don't believe me when I check the record of what Jesus looked like. They don't say that he had slick hair and looked like a hippie. They said in Revelation that he has feet like burnished bronze and hair like lamb's wool. That means that he looked kind of like us. And why do I have to say that? Because there's always somebody who's saying that it does not matter the color of Christ. I agree with you. It does not matter the color of Christ. But the preacher who was telling me that, he said, you don't need to worry about all this race stuff, Moss, because it divides us. Well, I said, you're right. If you believe that it divides us, then why don't you put a black Jesus in your church? If it's such a problem, if it's not a problem, let me see how long you'll be preaching. If you have a black Jesus in your church, and I'm here to let you know if Jesus started to have a little more dark skin, then maybe you couldn't have mass incarceration. If Jesus had a little dark skin, then maybe you would not have to have the transatlantic slave trade because you'd raise the question that we have somebody who looks like us. So Joseph had to take Mary and Jesus back to Africa. And that's what we have to do as a community. We've got to return to Africa. What do you mean return to Africa? Because when we return to Africa, it means that we've got to have a consciousness. If God says Africa's an all right place, then what's wrong with us? We got to stop looking down at our own people. Stop looking down at ourselves and know that you're beautiful the way you are. You don't need any extra help. You don't need to buy anything from anybody else. God made you beautiful just the way you are. The Bible says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Is there anybody in here? Do you know that you're made by God, designed by God, blessed by God? Oh, we've got to return to Africa. When we turn to Africa, we recognize that we place ourselves within a context where we see our own excellence. That's the beautiful thing about HBCUs. Because when you're at a historically black college, you get to see people who look just like you achieving like you 
teaching you and all of a sudden it does something to your spirit but what is amazing about an HBCU is that when you go to an HBCU graduation it'll start out with pomp and circumstance but it'll always end out as a Pentecostal revival meeting because every year there'll be somebody that will say please hold your applause until the class of 2018 receive their degrees and then we will clap for everyone who has received their degree but what the dean of academic affairs doesn't know is that big mama shows up every year and she's been waiting all her life to see her child walk across the stage we've got to return to Africa and in Africa we witness excellence in Africa we see that we are no longer the minority what this is uh, metaphorically is that we've got to see ourselves in a different light in the way that God sees us we've got to raise our expectations raise the way that we see ourselves raise the way we treat each other we've got to bond together that's why Salem's got to work with Trinity and Trinity's got to work with the CMEs and the CMEs got to work with the AMEs and the AMEs got to work with the ABCs and the ABCs got to work with the apostolics and the apostolics got to work with the Kojics and the Kojics got to work with the holiness because if we get together we can turn this thing around I'm trying to tell you that we've got to return and begin to see ourselves from a different perspective and so it is Joseph Mary and Jesus they stay in Africa until Herod dies mm, you missed your shout you see every Herod has term limits he can't stay in power forever let me say it again every Herod has term limits and so Mary and Joseph come back after Herod dies but don't get confused and think because Herod dies that there will be no more Herods Herods keep showing up it may be an Herod by the name of Andrew Jackson it may be a Herod by the name of George Wallace it may be a Herod by the name of Ronald Reagan it may be the Herod by the name I'm not gonna say his name it may be a Herod but Herod has term limits stay until Herod dies and eventually Herod died but you see another Herod came to power and he was the Herod that gave the order to crucify Jesus and my Bible tells me that they hung him high and they stretched him wide and then he died and it seemed as every as if everybody was happy that Jesus was now dead from my recollection from my sanctified imagination the baker was excited that Jesus was dead because business was booming because no longer was there anybody feeding 5,000 with a few pieces of bread and a few pieces of catfish the winemaker was excited that Jesus was dead because Jesus was turning H2O into Merlot and now the winemakers could make some more money it was uh, the pimps were excited that Jesus was dead because no longer are people caught in adultery given forgiveness the doctors were excited that Jesus was dead because he was given free health care everywhere everywhere he went the prosperity preachers were excited Jesus was dead because nobody was kicking over tables anymore the politicians were excited that Jesus was dead because he was saying no longer was anyone saying the last shall be first and the first shall be last the fishermen were excited that Jesus was dead because now they could catch fish and sell them at the highest price demons were excited Jesus was dead because they no longer were being evicted from bodies they could wreak havoc however they felt the devil was excited that Jesus was dead and so everybody was happy on Friday that Jesus was dead everybody was happy on Saturday that Jesus was dead but my Bible tells me something happened late and early early on 
on Sunday morning, something happened. The devil was trying to hold Jesus down, and death was trying to hold him down too, and his body began to move. And so the devil said, hold on, death. Why don't you just hold him down? I'm going to go out and try and tempt some more people. Do you have this? Death says, I got this. Nobody can get out of my grip. So the devil went one way, and death held on to Jesus. But early on Sunday morning, Jesus started moving and got up with all power in his hands. And when the devil came back to death, he said, hey, man, I thought you said you had him. He said, I had him for a minute, but he started moving. So I had to use both hands. And when I used both hands, the dead started walking around all over the place. I tried to sit down on him, but he pushed me off. I tried to email you at your email address, satan at hellmail.com. I tried to send a Twitter post right there at devil in you. I tried to post on Facebook, but my Facebook account was down. I tried to let you know that he got up with all power in his hands. I'm here to let you know if we are to counter the conspiracy to destroy black children, that we've got to return to Africa. We've got to know who we are. But at the same time, there is no power like the power that comes from Jesus. Good night. May the Lord bless you real good. But there's power in the name. There's power in the name. There's power in the name. Can you say his name? Say his name. Call his name. Holler his name. There's power in his name. Good night. May the Lord bless you real good. But it's time to fight Salem. It's time to fight the conspiracy. Stand up against Herod and every other empire. We have the power. We have the authority. We have the strength. We have the boldness. Is there anybody in here? Are you ready? Are you ready?